what's the root cause? And in my opinion, always the root cause comes back to unsound metabolic health and lack of muscle mass. I mean, over and over and over again, I could just, it's not sexy, you know. I, I find it interesting too, you're seeing a lot of these big health influencers, which I respect them all, and I've been a fan of many of them for years, but you and I were talking muscle mass and metabolic health five years ago, and they were talking vegetarianism and yoga. Mm -hmm. And now they're talking strength training and protein, right? right? And so it's like, I'm glad the messaging's getting through finally, and it's coming from bigger platforms. And so I think identifying by your diagnosis is a very slippery slope because it gives you an excuse. I know for, I lived it. I can't go to that thing. I can say no to every invitation I don't want to go to because, oh my, whatever's flaring. And I still have some funny stuff that I have to think about. I have a funny back and I just say I have a hitch in my giddy up. I have to train a little differently than I did a few years ago. I have to do things a little differently. I have to be a lot more conscientious about some of the movements I make. That doesn't mean I'm crippled or incapacitated. A good example is a herniated disc. Oh, I have an L5S1 disc herniation and I'm like, join the club. <laughs> so, <laughs> so does common. everybody. But you know, herniations heal. People don't talk about that part. They think, oh, the herniation happened and I'm forever. I'm a chiropractor too. So like this was very much a part of my practice and oh, I have a herniation here and here. It's like, yes, and they heal. As long as your body is in a regenerative state, those are going to suck back in and heal up. Hey friends, welcome back. So today's show with Dr. Tina Moore is brought to you by myoscience.com. So it's summertime. I know you're outside exercising, you're sweating. It's really hot in a lot of parts of the world. So we have put together one of the world's most comprehensive electrolyte solutions that's available, featuring Redmond Real Salt, Magnesium, Potassium, Calcium, plus the synergistic nutrients, taurine and creatine, which actually help to make the electrolytes better absorbed, better utilized by your skeletal muscle, better hydration, and we're supporting the body's healthy hydration response. So we're going to talk today a lot about metabolic health, the importance of regular exercise, the importance of muscle as a contributor towards longevity and especially for women. Now one thing that a lot of people don't really recognize is women don't store as much creatine and actually clinical studies show that creatine offers a lot of health benefits for women. So there's one gram of creatine per serving in the electrolyte sticks again with all the other synergistic nutrients to help this function better. So before your next sauna session, before your next high intensity interval session or weight training session, I would implore you to take one serving before or during the workout, see what you notice, see what you feel. There's a 30 day money back guarantee. There's over 250 reviews on the website milescience.com where you can save using the coupon code podcast at checkout. Again, that's podcast over at myoscience.com M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com. Use the code podcast to save. Now this conversation with Dr. Tina is a great one. Her and I have been friends for a number of years. We've recorded several videos together over the past several years, but in today's session, we talk about the pandemic. We talk about how health has really been largely ignored by the health experts. We talk about how people are not making the right decisions with when it comes to their lifestyle that can prevent them from getting severely ill. And we talk about a lot of false dichotomies that have been propagated through sort of this group consensus group think like, if you don't wear your mask, you must want someone to die. And we talk about how we can think better because we're starting to see more and more fear mongering coming back from the media with regards to monkeypox and potential, you know, counties in Los Angeles and other schools might be reinforcing mandates and face mask mandates. And friends, we gotta think better about this and be less sort of reactive and be a little bit more open-minded about the actual data and addressing the root cause of the problem. There was a recent study that we reviewed here showing that over 93% of US adults have poor cardiometabolic health, meaning that only 6% of the adult population is cardiometabolically healthy. Why aren't we hearing about this? We need to focus on the root cause of the problem and how metabolic dysfunction translates into immune incompetence. So I really hope you enjoy the show and all the links and articles that we talk about and show notes will be below. So let's cut back to it with Dr. Tina Moore. Tina Moore, it's great to be with you again. Thanks, uh, we I'm are, so happy to be here. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, it's been a few years. You know, we did some regenerative therapy type work at your clinic in, in uh, Portland, and that was wonderful. And it's funny, we were talking a lot about the back then, this was like 2018, friends. And so I'll put this in the links below, but we talked a lot about muscle and the health of the immune system. And here we are two and a half years into the global pandemic. And those two topics and conversations are even more sort of apropos with what's going on in the world. Um, and maybe let's just to frame that up, you know, just in case folks haven't, you know, heard your messages before or watched those videos, the platelet-rich plasma 
yeah. you know, that, that you would make yourself by pulling out whole blood and spinning it down. You could tell sort of or ascertain the health of someone's immune system by just looking at like the fat content in, in their blood. And I think that is so interesting. And it gave you, I think, a, a much broader perspective about immune health and metabolic health right when this virus started to make its way into the U.S. And that became a big focal point of your what you're you know, podcasting and work on social. Um, so what was that like, you know, drawing, say, my blood or someone who exercises and then spinning down their platelets and looking at the plasma compared to someone who smokes or is overweight and doesn't eat healthy? Like maybe describe that. I think it's a nice visual for people. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that in a long time. So I would run, you know, six to eight people's blood a day and spin it out. And the first thing we would notice is the lipids in the blood. So it would be very cloudy if they were, you know, not as metabolically sound, even if they hadn't eaten breakfast that day, you know, if they'd eaten, definitely they would have a lipid response because their liver would be producing it. But um, even if they hadn't, their blood would look very different. And then on the second spin, when we would start to harvest out the platelets, they would all be clumped together or stuck together. So I could tell for, via that first and second spin how that person was going to respond because if what I pulled out of them was pro-inflammatory and then I just concentrated it down and shot it back into their inflamed joint, you know, yes, it would bring healing, but it also would probably be a more painful experience for them and, you know, more of a flare potentially as they were healing versus it just being sort of a walk in the park the next few days. So yeah, that's, it was very telling what their blood was doing. That is really interesting. And of course the platelets now are, we're hearing so much more about clotting. You know, people are getting uh, blood clots because of global warming. Um, there was one article about people are getting blood clots because they're drinking black tea. All of a sudden we've been drink humans have been drinking black tea for <laughs> thousands of years, but all of a sudden black tea is causing people to get blood clots. I mean, it's, it's quite, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah. It is funny. You know, I had a clotting problem when I was in my early twenties, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disorder of my platelets. And one of the first things they noted before they found the platelets to be low was that they couldn't get a good count on my platelets because they were clumping together. So my immune system was activating and causing my platelets to glom up together and not go through the counter cleanly so they couldn't, you know, pick them apart. And suddenly my platelets started dropping, but that was my body attacking my own platelets in an autoimmune place. I think I was 22 when that also, I mean, that's really what sent me on this journey through all of this. So when people hear me just beating the drum on muscle and metabolic health and all the things. It comes from so much personal experience, but also, you know, over 10 years doing regenerative medicine, you can't regenerate joints in an unhealthy individual. And so my job was literally to pick the right patients and then apply the right treatment to get their joints to regenerate. And that starts with a healthy substrate that starts with a healthy individual. So that's where I'm so fervent about this. I'm not just somebody who was sitting back taking notes and helping patients through their blood tests. You know, like, oh, let me look at your labs and assess you in, in a functional medicine way. Like I was physically trying to get, get people's joints to regenerate. And so that was the work I did for 10 years in clinic. Um, and so I, and then my, again, my own personal experience of being underweight and sick and autoimmune and then putting on 10 plus pounds of muscle over the past many years. Like this is... This is what we got, right? Mm -hmm. You and I have been saying the only way out is through. Right. And I feel like we are back at square one at this point for various reasons where that is more true than ever. And we've had almost three years where people could have had the opportunity mm -hmm. to take us seriously, but instead, you know, a lot of, I mean, and we probably did help a lot of people through our messaging, but a lot of people got mad at us. Which was weird. Um, and I want to get to that, uh, but but your autoimmune disease, yeah. Um, is that cured, so to speak? Like, do you have to worry about that at this point in time, clotting issues or anything, where because you've changed your nutrition, lifestyle, exercise so much that the immune system's tolerance is like more manageable? Yeah, so I like to say I have a funny immune system. I really don't like diagnosing people and giving them more diagnoses to add to their list because I find that a lot of people use their diagnosis as an excuse for a lot of things. And I was also to blame. I remember wearing, I mean, my platelets were so low at one point that I remember wearing around a bracelet that said if I, cause if I hit my head, like if I got in a car accident and hit my head with my platelets being that low, the 
risk of me hemorrhaging was very high. So I had this sort of medical alert bracelet. And I remember one day driving down the I-5 in San Diego and just literally like pitching the bracelet out the window. I was done. I was like, I no longer identify by this. I'm going to get my shit together. Mm -hmm. And so I like to say I have a funny immune system and it is funny. (laughs) It doesn't always respond the way that I would hope it would, but it does a pretty damn good job, all things considered. And no, I mean, my platelets are normal. My clotting factors are normal. My labs are enviable. And it's just lifestyle, lifestyle, lifestyle. And I just don't have a lot. I don't have the tolerance bands that a lot of people have, meaning I can't push myself as far as somebody who has more vitality. Mm -hmm. You know, someone who has maybe a little bit more moderate or a moderated immune system. I have to just be really cognizant of what I put in my mouth and how I live my life and the amount of sleep I get and the amount of stress that I endure. All of those things quickly catch up to me if I'm not careful. I like that. And then the use of the word funny Instead of saying, I have this congenital disorder, therefore I can't do X, Y, or Z. So I think language has power, right? And, and I, I see so many people now identifying with, I'm a long hauler. I have POTS. I have Hashimoto's. I have PCOS. And then so that causes them to think twice before doing an ice bath. To like, is this exercise safe if you have X condition? Right. And once that becomes your identity, I mean, that seems like it's, good luck trying to heal, you know, good luck trying to find the op- to create the opportunities to get better. And so we were kind of talking about this, like you are not your diagnosis. And is this something that you've talked with patients about over the years? Like, Hey, trying to remove yourself or disassociate yourself from that identity. Yeah. And you just made a post about it, which, you know, brought it back up. I, I did a podcast on my show recently called you, you are not your diagnosis because I'm just, uh, I was on uh, Sean Stevenson's podcast and I said something to the likes of if you are suffering with chronic disease, it's, and you, you're choosing to stay in this world of chronic disease and chronic pain. It's very much your own doing. I, I truly believe we give ourselves our autoimmune disease. And I, I realize that makes a lot of people upset, but I say that the part that people didn't hear on social media was I say that as my own lived experience. Mm-hmm. And I say that from treating hundreds, thousands of patients over the years. Um, mindset is everything around this, right? And so For instance, patients would come in and say, I need PRP or I need stem cells on my shoulder. And I'm like, actually, you have no muscle mass. So let's start there because nine times out of 10, getting some, you know, building a shelf here is going to improve your pain. So I would send them to my strength and conditioning coach or the team that I used. I didn't send them to a PT. I didn't send them to a chiropractor because I wasn't looking for more diagnoses. You send them to the PT, there's another diagnosis. You send them to the chiropractor, there's another. And they're all similar diagnoses. We just speak kind of different languages. And now they've got a conglomeration of excuses as to why they can't do anything with their shoulder versus just, I'm like, hey, don't spend the money in my clinic. Go spend that money, you know, come back in 90 days. Tell me if you don't feel better. And nine times out of 10, I'd see him at the gym Mm -hmm. and I'd be like, Hey, what's up? How's your shoulder? And they're waving at me with their bad shoulder. They're like, I feel great. (laughs) You know? And then if I needed to treat them, it was with something less expensive and less potent, like prolotherapy, you know, like Mm -hmm. dextrose instead of needing to pull out the big expensive guns. And I find that to be true with autoimmune diseases. People would come in and say, well, I have Hashimoto's and I'm like, join the club. You know, I'm bone on bone, join the club who everyone else who comes in here is too. That does not make you special. Like most women, in my opinion, over the age of 40, probably have some thyroid issue. And most of those women have Hashimoto. So like join the club. It's pretty common nowadays with toxicity and just our environment, the world we live in. So I think that having, and I got, you probably got it too in your DMs every time early on in the pandemic, when I would talk about metabolic health or strength training or just getting your health house together, people would message me and say, well, my functional medicine doctor says because of my hormonal imbalance, I can't do that right now. And I'm like, well, your hormones are never going to be balanced if you don't get your metabolic health in order and your metabolic health is never going to get in order if you don't build some muscle. Beautiful. I love (laughs) this. Yeah. It's so important. It, yeah, we create these limitations based upon what someone had sent to, said to us and who they themselves may not even exercise or have good metabolic health. Right. You're like, well, so you're, you're hearing these things, but you're not taking the steps in order. Like if we think about um, fat, people will say, well, fasting is, is bad for your cortisol. You're like, okay, wake, getting out of bed is bad for you. Like if you're going to look at <laughs> a little el- transient elevations in cortisol, um, standing up or, or driving in your car during rush hour or eating food raises cortisol. So, yeah. so she, you should never eat. We have to look at these things in context and yeah. look at the bigger picture. And I, I, I can't help but wonder if how schools are set up with uh, the safetyism, 
mindset and, you know, you have to raise your hand, ask your teacher if it's okay to talk, if that has sort of like infused itself into health and medicine. And so we feel like, well, someone said this to me, so therefore, you know, I, I can't do X, Y, or Z. And, and so anyway, removing yourself from the diagnosis and this point, this vantage of I'm a victim, I'm yep. weak into changing, reframing the conversation and using maybe language, like you said, funny or weird, or like I have a back issue, but I don't ever tell myself it's chronic. It's like, oh, my back is a little sore today. So therefore I need to do these rehabilitation exercises because if I start to tell myself it's a weak back, then I'll, I'll literally throw it out. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because the mind is so powerful. And so I think it's really important, especially with COVID because people identify as, oh, I'm immune compromised. Or I'm vulnerable. They'll that, say these things. That word has been way overused. Right. Like to the point of it being offensive to the truly immunocompromised. Exactly. A lot of people are lifestyle induced immunocompromised and they're using it as their reasoning when there's truly people out there who are on chemotherapy or on immunosuppressive drugs who truly are immunocompromised, right? And it's it's just gotten, you're so right. I, I didn't mean to cut you off. It's no, just, no, it's I, gotten out of control because it's like POTS. Uh, this is a more recent terminology that's come around and I'm not discounting. I have POTS, yeah. turns out. Didn't know because there wasn't a code for it mm -hmm. when I was originally experiencing the symptomology. It was just called adrenal fatigue and the you know, the symptomology was due to the hypothalamic pituitary axis, adrenal axis being compromised, right? So i.e. POTS, which is sort of like a, it's kind of like asthma. It's these umbrella diagnoses that what's the root cause? And in my opinion, always the root cause comes back to unsound metabolic health and lack of muscle mass. I mean, over and over and over again, I could just, it's not sexy. So nobody, you know, I, I find it interesting too. You're seeing a lot of these big health influencers, which I respect them all. And I've been a fan of many of them for years, but you know, they, you and I were talking muscle mass and metabolic health five years ago, and they were talking vegetarianism and yoga. Mm -hmm. And now they're talking strength training and protein, right? right? And so it's like, I'm glad the messaging's getting through finally, and it's coming from bigger platforms. But a lot of people have sort of bought in. And you're right, I think the safetyism starting even in schools, you have to raise your hand and ask permission to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. It's just wild, you know? And kids from other countries are like, what? Wait, what? what are we <laughs> What's here? going on here? And so I think identifying by your diagnosis is a very slippery slope because it gives you an excuse. I know for, I lived it. I can't go to that thing. I can say no to every invitation I don't want to go to because, oh, my whatever's flaring. Or I can't go on that trip because of whatever. And I still have some funny stuff that I have to think about. I have a funny back. And I just say I have a hitch in my giddy up. I have to train a little differently than I did a few years ago. I have to do things a little differently. I have to be a lot more conscientious about some of the movements I make. That doesn't mean I'm crippled or incapacitated. A good example is a herniated disc. People love loved oh i have an l5 s1 disc herniation and i'm like join the club <laughs> so, <laughs> so does common. everybody but you know herniations heal people don't talk about that part they think oh the herniation happened and i'm forever i'm a chiropractor too so like this was very much a part of my practice and oh i have a herniation here and here it's like yes and they heal as long as your body is in a regenerative state those are going to suck back in and heal up it's just like cutting your finger it doesn't stay you know splayed open forever and so people in medicine, we sort of, and I'll say this too, this has been known in the orthopedic community for decades. They write MRIs to justify surgery. Mm. So everything is worst case scenario. I can't tell you how many patients came into my clinic saying, well, my MRI says this. And I would specifically, an old timey doc taught me this, evaluate your patient, take the history and do the physical exam before you look at the imaging report, mm. come up with your own diagnosis. And so that's how I do things. And I would get the MRI and it would just look like a horror story. And I've got a patient with a fully functional range of motion. There might be a little pain, you know, at a very specific spot that would tell me, you know, classically your rotator cuff muscles or whatever. But I'm like, that's super fixable. And their orthopedist had just scared the bejesus out of them and told them, you know, you need immediate surgery. Your shoulder is trashed. And you're not going to, and you know, they love to get guys like you. They love to get these guys in their thirties and forties and fifties who are active and fit because you're a cash cow. Mm -hmm. So if you have an ACL injury, or if you have a rotator cuff injury, they're going to convince you that your lifestyle of activity is going to be compromised very soon. If you don't do X, Y, or Z. Yeah. And I'm not saying all orthopedic surgeons are, you know, scoundrels. Right. It's how they make their money. But that's just medicine as an example. You know, it's like, here's the horrific MRI report. And in front of me is a person with great mobility, 
um, great motor strength. Everything's good. I don't see any neurologic deficits. I just see pain hanging them up and we can treat the pain with some sugar water mm-hmm. or their own blood. Like right. how, like that to me early on made me realize how much of a scam allopathic medicine really really Mm -hmm. was. And I see it so much even in the functional medicine community and the naturopathic community. You've got a very unhealthy practitioner who probably has fatty liver and metabolic disease themselves, hawking a bunch of pills and telling the patient like, oh, here's your limitations and it's okay. It's not your fault. And I'm like, is anybody deadlifting? (laughs) Like, is anyone working to, and we all can, we can, we can all do something to strengthen our, our bodies and improve our resilience. And yet it's just sort of like, oh, that's for the meatheads or the whatever, all the names we got called. Mm-hmm. It, it's so true. And and we see this with lab testing too, and food allergy testing and, you know, and, and I'm a big fan of testing, right? Just Chem 24, CBC with differential enough, people need more, more boutique labs, fine. But there's a lot of people who uh, go to the doctor, an initial consults, you know, $2,000 worth of labs right out of the gate. And it's like, um, it's crazy. It's insane. Yeah. Um, so I think this, this whole notion of resilience is really now actionable, especially with regards to new subvariants of Omicron or whatever the latest, you know, media fear mongering is, we need to be more resilient. And that's, we can't rely upon other people doing certain things to make us feel safer or to, you know, this community level masking to decrease, you know, hypothetically viral load or whatever. It, the onus is on you to, to be healthy. And I think why you and I got so much criticism is because there's this idea that this whole safety as a mindset has has sort of infiltrated like every major institution in life, how certain words are um, considered threatening. You know, if you don't uh, accept, you know, if we talk about gender identity or something like that, um, if you, if you, you know, refute the idea that biologic males can give birth, then therefore that means you want transgender people to commit suicide. It's like, no, 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 we're talking about completely different things. So this whole safety as a mindset has just infiltrated every aspect. So when you tell someone you can actually become more resilient and less vulnerable, then that means somehow that you don't care about people, which is not the case. These are different ideas. We're trying to help people become healthier. And you and your profession, you've taken a lot of heat for helping people to become more resilient. Somehow that makes you, uh, uh, what is it, genocide or genocide? Yeah, eugenist. I was it's for, roundabout accused of that, yes. That's insane. And lots of other names, which is interesting because docere, which is tattooed on my wrist, is one of our naturopathic tenants. Doctor is teacher. So I got a lot of heat from a lot of even big influencers, people you know, um, early on, just coming, dropping into my DMs, just sla- trying to slaughter me with words. And I was like, isn't our like oath to teach people? And I don't know. I... I assume it's empowering. I am coming from a place of like, hey, if you know better, you do better. The more you know, right? Wasn't that like the slogan on Mm -hmm. NBC or whatever? Like the more you know, like the after school stuff. So if you know what to do and you take action to do it, you're improving your outcomes no matter what. And then there was a lot of the pushback of, well, people don't have time. Well, we're two and a half plus years in, people have had time. You know, the minute you start making appropriate changes, things start shifting in your favor. Mm -hmm your labs start improving, your inflammation starts to go down, your resilience starts to improve. Your Our bodies are very adaptable and magical and they work great when you give them what they need. And so just going to bed on time, going for walks a couple times a day. I mean, that's an old naturopathic adage. Take a berberine, go for a walk after a meal. Long before we had the data to support it. I mean, I'm so, it's like, I, I almost wake up every morning now and I'm like, in recent studies that of what, you know, Mike and Tina have been saying for two and a half years. <laughs> now right. we have the data. Every single thing that you and I shared was right. But we're still the villains. We're still bad. We're we, still we the bad care. people. Yeah. And it's like, I thought that giving people information to help them save themselves was empowering. I didn't realize that made me the enemy. And it's just, I think it's like being the kid in the room that raises their hand. And I've always been that kid. Like, let me just state the obvious. Like, here's the big elephant in the room, big pink elephant or the unicorn. Like, let's just call it out. And people don't, for some weird reason, don't want that. And I think they thought if they stayed holed up and that that was the first thing I got pushed back on was like, we're all going to be exposed. And Fauci comes out the other day and was like, the vaccines aren't working and we're all going to be exposed. So, but we're still the bad guys. And I, it's very interesting to me how this played out because I was trying to empower people as were you. Yeah, it's the weirdest thing. I mean, we still, um, we're all going to be exposed to this new Omicron subvariant. So 
but people are ref- like going back to the same playbook of, oh, we need to, you know, stay in our house and bring masks back in, in right. kids' schools. It's like, wait, wait, no, but th- th- that's not what it is. We, we, why aren't we talking about the things that we can do to actually be less resilient? I'm sorry, less vulnerable, more resilient. Um, so yeah, I wonder, I wonder what it is from a mindset standpoint, maybe in a society, you need a small, you need a lot of people. I'm just thinking like teleologically, evolutionary, maybe if there's too many people who can think for themselves, maybe a society doesn't work. So they need like a small subset of people who can see through stuff and educate. Like, I'm just trying to figure out like, right. how is this happening again? Yeah. Why are we back to square one <laughs> no. when we now have all the data and the guy who's been promoting these messages, he himself got COVID and he's 80 and he's just fine. Like he's, he said, he's I'm just fine. So why are you, you have an eight year old. Why are you scared about your eight year old when the 80 year old so yeah it's, it's weird. the messaging i was just yeah. listening to the health minister of canada i think two days ago come out and just spew blatant lies you know get boosted do the thing it's for the betterment of you know it's for the greater good protect your loved ones it stops transmission mm-hmm. it stops infection i mean he flat out lied mm-hmm. i pulled the video so that i would have it on my phone so i would have proof i mean i i literally sent it to all my canadian friends and i'm like every single word here is a lie. So that's the messaging they're getting and they don't look past it. Mm -hmm. They don't clearly dive deeper, I guess, where I've always wanted to know, I, I haven't trusted the government since I was, I don't know, 12, 13. I remember clearly being like, something is, we are not being told everything here, you know? And so I'm a digger. I'm a, I'm a terrier. I like to dig and I will dig until I find answers. And then I'm able to, a lot of what I was sharing was based on, basic sciences pre 20 I have the textbooks pre 2020 I have all my medical textbooks here's virology 101 right and yet what was being shared out was such a blatant just I don't know what you want to call it I I, we could call it a lie but it was also just propaganda right and for whatever what their long game is we can only speculate um and it's like okay, you have this information and then I have an education and I have the ability to critically think. So here's my thought process. Here's my hypothesis. And here's all the studies to back that up. And people would just descend just like demons upon me. And I was like, what am I? And it was interesting to see it come from my colleagues. Cause I'm like, we were sitting in class together when we learned this, we took board exams. I remember where they were in the room during the board exam, during like this, this information. Yeah. And yet I'm, they just couldn't stop. They still can't stop having a heyday about me. And I'm like, why? Like, I'm telling the truth. I have objective data. And that's the other part. When did objective data start having feelings applied to it? You share something that's objective and people get so mad and triggered and you're a horrible person. And I'm like, it's data. That's the beauty of it. It's objective. Maybe people don't know what that means. Yeah, it's, I don't know how that, that association between um, empowering people has become linked with you want other people t- to die in this. Yeah, it, it's very bizarre. But um, going back to what you were saying, and, and one of these individuals we've had on our podcast who happens to be very uh, versed in this whole field of inflammaging or uh, immunometabolism. And I think that to me is the most, it sounds a little confusing, like a lot of technical words um, sort of built into to, to that, but it's it's very timely and relevant. And I think maybe that is an area where we can help people with tangible tips and things like that. So this idea that our immune system and our metabolism are really two sides of the same coin, two, they're, they're interconnected. Um, if we think about an inflammatory cytokine called TNF-alpha, it used to be called cachectin because it induced muscle wasting. Uh, and, and so it's maybe we can get into some of that because, I, again, you know, you see people who are, are quad boosted or what, whatever the term is, fully protected, but they're still eating McDonald's and they don't recognize the fact that, hey, this smoldering low grade inflammation that you're inducing in your immune system from the foods that you're eating is actually rendering your, your immune system less weak. And it's maybe not producing the same protective effect with that immunization that you might think that it is. Right. So. So I like to think of it in terms of fire. So the virus itself induces a lot of fire in your system. And when you are inflamed, you waste. That's the cachexia. 
you start to waste away. And so it's a very wasting virus. And we saw that from the get go. And it happened to me. I mean, I just dropped a bunch of muscle mass. My husband dropped, you know, and the more inflammatory the response, the more wasting the person. So that's when I knew it's interesting. My husband has better vitality and a more or a less funny immune system than I do. And he got hit much harder because he tends to be a bit more inflammatory of a person, very young energy, you know, um, history of heart disease in his family. And I knew he would get hard, hit harder. Interestingly, he came back faster than I did. I had a harder recovery. It wasn't a big deal, but, and I'm used to it. I'm used to getting hit. I'm used to getting nailed by viruses. And then like, it's a bit of a, you know, pushback. So you've got this sort of pro-inflammatory wasting virus and there's lots of ACE2 receptors on fat cells for it to bind to. And folks carrying around a lot of visceral fat are basically carrying around a fire inside. It's a cytokine factory, if you will. And cytokines are very pro-inflammatory. And then they're living a pro-inflammatory lifestyle with the pro-inflammatory foods they're eating. They're staying up all night. They're not getting good sleep. I mean, they're literally just a fire brewing. And if you and I were to run labs on them, it would just look like a hot mess of inflammation. And this is how I talk to my patients. I'd be like, your labs show a hot mess of inflammation. We got to work on this, right? So they walk into the infection as a hot mess of inflammation and they might be thin. They might be tofi, you know, thin on the outside, fat on the inside, which you and I have talked about on my podcast as well. And the minute the virus hits them, they seem okay for a few days. But what people don't realize is it sort of tweaks your interferon response. Meaning the way I describe it to my husband is it's like the guards at the gate are knocked offline it knocks the guards at the gate offline and it just enters the castle. And by the time the body figures out it's in the castle, it's replicated, Mm -hmm. especially if there's lots of fat cells and like vacancy signs, if you will. Mm -hmm. So if the body's inflamed and has lots of fat cells, lots of binding sites. And so now the party's, you know, the, the castle's being overran and the party's going off in a bad way. And then phase two of the immune system kicks on and goes, Oh shoot, we have a problem. And it, explodes in a really non-orchestrated way your immune system is like a finely tuned orchestra but all of a sudden they just come out with like a bass drum or one big boom and the fire starts and i think of it like on game of thrones like that wildfire that would start and just that's what happens inside the body and once that cytokine storm is on this is why day six to ten is concerning you got to keep an eye on the person because once that fire starts it's very hard to turn off. And there's really nothing modern medicine can do to turn it off once that happens. This is why people decompensate quickly and end up, you know, on ventilator or in the hospital. And there's been no messaging around that from the health authorities, which is you really can do a lot in your day-to-day lifestyle to mitigate that from ever happening in the first place. Also on that note, there's two, there's two things here I want to get on. One is these are also the folks who tend to have the most propensity to long haulers. Mm. So once that fire starts, it kind of like low grade simmers. And we've known this. And I mean, I was a long hauler with a different virus. We just didn't Mm. have a word for it. And so us long haulers are like, oh, finally, we're not being gaslit. (laughs) People are acknowledging that you can have post viral syndrome. It's a real thing. Not always, you know, and that's where other people are like, my uncle doesn't fit your profile of what you're sharing on this study. So therefore it can't be true. So I'm saying here, it's not everyone, but generally speaking, if you walk into those most susceptible to poor outcomes with this virus are also those most susceptible to long haulers are also those most susceptible to the vaccine, not working well on them. And they don't seroconvert well, meaning they don't have a really orchestrated good immune response to it. We knew you and I knew this and we're sharing this about influenza prior to these vaccines even being released and we were trying to warn people like hey even if you want to get vaccinated you still got to get your metabolic health together Mm -hmm. and so right now we're just sitting in like it's just a mess in my opinion i look around and i'm like this is a complete catastrophe that could have been i don't care which way people want to pursue their immunity um, but at least if you're going to either route you need your metabolic health intact and you need muscle mass Mm -hmm. and you need to be eating food that that doesn't light a fire inside of you (laughs) you know but no it was like jabs and donuts and free donuts right it's insane and and the problem here is social media has prevented us from having these conversations so exactly what you just said it's it's not necessarily the virus that is causing the inflammation it's almost like an a a, a, um misfired auto uh, autoimmune reaction in, in the sense so it's your own immune system that is overzealously reaction but reacting because the interferon response was not there to thwart viral replication in the beginning. And so a a mutual friend of ours, Ben Lynch, actually said this in a post. 
And Facebook reported that, it, or someone reported it, and it got thrown down by Facebook, and his account got throttled back for spreading misinformation, for suggesting that it's actually people's own yeah. poor immune system's response to the actual infection that is the problem, not the infection itself. So therefore, we should you know, fine-tune the immune system by doing everything you just said. Nutrition, exercise, lifestyle change, sleep. And that was considered misinformation. But this, the immunopathology is vetted at this point about how this so yeah we've we've gotten to this place where no you can't talk about that that's that's you know that's um you know not uh, equitable so to speak right right so it, it's really it's yeah. it's wild because everybody can do something correct to improve their outcomes and most of it's free i understand not everybody has access to the foods that we describe as being ideal and not everyone has access to a gym but everybody can do something mm -hmm. to improve their outcomes and they're not even being given the information. I don't know about you, but that's super disrespectful to the communities that supposedly this saviorism is protecting. I've worked with these communities in community clinic settings. And last time I checked, these were intelligent folks who, whether they didn't have the financial means or they, there was racial disparities, they were intelligent human beings who, when you gave them information, figured out how to make it work. I've action. worked in clinics where people couldn't afford supplements and they couldn't afford any of the stuff, but you know what? They could do short-term water fast. They could go walking. They could make sure they put themselves to bed on time. They could do some things and mm -hmm. they knew how. And truthfully, if you give people information, a lot of us actually had grandparents that taught us a lot of cool stuff. We knew people inherently, I mean, maybe the younger generations are forgetting this, but there's just a lot of knowledge base in the human world and all over the world. Hydrotherapy, just really simple stuff that people can do that's free. And they just need to know what it is and how to do it. It's not, you know, it's not rocket science and it doesn't require fancy biohacking anything. You know, naturopathic medicine is really medicine for the people. And so utilizing water and I mean, I know you cold dunk, but even just using tap water, warm and cold tap water, going to bed on time, circadian rhythm, all this stuff that's been like scientific. I don't know what the word is. Like there's, well, for how long and how many minutes and what temperature? And I'm like, I don't, I, it doesn't actually matter to me. Yeah. I just do it. Tonify well. your being so your vitality improves and you too will be having just like prior to COVID when you got the flu or when you encountered anything, you had better outcomes when you went into it in a healthy state. Mm -hmm. it, it's a beautiful point. And, and this idea uh, that we're, that those people that are chronically inflamed are more susceptible to long haul. Um, what is it? Is it the smoldering background inflammation? Um, what, what do you think is that that is rendering them more susceptible? I think it's a lot of things. I wrote a whole series in my Substack about this, and I think it goes back to the same things we understood prior to COVID. And my community that we're treating chronic, you know, post viral syndrome, which is mitochondrial dysfunction, potentially, you know, they go into it with my, this is why I think we're seeing some of these thin, supposedly healthy folks having long haulers. I think they had probably some severe mitochondrial dysfunction. It could have been due to lifestyle. It could have been due to too many rounds of certain antibiotics. It could have been due to a lot of things, toxicity, whatever they could have epigenetically come out that way. Um, and then there's, you know, another hypothesis would be viral load just sort of stays at a certain simmer and doesn't really get under control by the immune system. And thirdly, the inflammation that it sets off, the low grade simmer of inflammation that keeps going. And there's a couple other points, but it's that culmination. So it's really hard to put your finger on, but I'll tell you my colleagues who, especially the ones practicing in Arizona and other states where they've been allowed more freedom to prescribe whatever they needed, you know, the drugs that were forbidden, they were using judiciously, um, they're having, they have no long hauler patients. Mm. Their patients who, their patients all got through COVID just fine. Many are reporting that very few had to go to hospital. They are treating a lot of injury now from mm -hmm. the going solution, but they are not dealing with long haulers and patients because they have the tools. I mean, it's just basic. I mean, shoot, if somebody just did basic hydrotherapy, you know, something as simple as sits baths, old school, right? Like mm -hmm. have a tub that has some cold water and have a warm tub. And even just dunking your perineum in alternating hot and cold can have incredibly tonifying. This is how they used to rehab people back in the day when people were just so infirm and sick. They would roll them out in the sun mm -hmm. and then they put them through sits baths or even just arms and legs. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be the full on cold ice dunk. 
In fact, that's sort of discouraged in naturopathic medicine when someone's vitality is really low. Mm -hmm. So someone who has POTS maybe just wants to turn their shower to cool and learn to get their arms and legs in and start there, you know, and then slowly but surely as your vitality builds, you can... You can implement strategies, being really conscious about your sleep instead of staying in bed all day, Mm -hmm. go to bed at a certain time, get up at a certain time, look at the sun, look at the daylight, even if it's raining, simple stuff. And the hydrotherapy, is that just moving blood around in lymph? What's the mechanism? I think so. And I think there's probably an impact on the CNS, the central nervous system. And, you know, there's a pretty rich plexus of nerves down in the perineum. So, I mean, that's something my mentor who has since passed away taught me was sits baths. When you, whenever I would come out of something and I just would be hammered by it, he's like, do your sits baths. Mm-hmm. So, and I always thought it was so stupid. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like I'm just putting basically like not even up to my waist, just, you know, like your, your bum in the hot and then the cold. And it wasn't even cold, icy water. You could make it that way if you wanted. We've also used a lot of hydrotherapy. You know, in 1918, the clinics that were using hydrotherapy constitutional hydrotherapy which is a series of towels hot and cold on the chest which we learned in naturopathic school those clinics had great outcomes Mm -hmm. and i heard a doctor talking all about it on youtube recently and he was going on and on about it and he attributed it to pts but actually it was an old naturopathic treatment Mm -hmm. and so and in the old you know the old sanatoriums they would wheel you out and they would give you exposure to um, the sun Mm -hmm. and how well you tanned was indicative of how your outcomes If you tanned well, if you tanned up well, the chances of you recovering were much higher. Mm. And they would take children who were completely crippled with tuberculosis, I mean, spinal abnormalities, and, you know, by the time they'd get them super tan and their spine would straighten out. And so we can use nature. Uh, We just have such a, I think we've just gotten so disconnected. I, I firmly believe that if this virus had hit in like the 1950s or 60s, it would have been easy. Right. I think humans are just so sickly that it really took its toll on us. And I, it's tragic and sad, but being in practice for 10 years and trying to help these people, most people did not want to change their lifestyles. They just wanted a shot or pill, mm-hmm. even if it was natural. And, and speaking of natural, um, it's been really sad. Hopefully we can talk about this. Seeing the naturopathic community at large, how they sort of have piv- like gotten disassociated with natural remedies in, in the context of of this particular pathogen. It's like, wait, wait, that's not why you initially went to school. And even the the Institute for Functional Medicine and other, you know, where before it was all about, you know, fasting and exercise and mitochondrial, uh, you know, biogenesis and enhancing the function of this critical intracellular, you know, organelle, the mitochondria. And and it's sort of like, we forgot all that like this. And, And I can't help but believe that there's this political identity to certain treatments and solutions. And so that has just, cause people to be blinded by their previous education. It's been super bizarre to see. It's been heartbreaking. Like at first I was sort of sideswiped. I didn't know what was happening because they were attacking me and they were attacking you. And I, and you know, you have a lot of friends in this community too. And I was, I mean, you've put a lot of naturopathic doctors on the map. You've given a lot of them an audience and a voice through your podcast and your blog. And to see people just turn, I was like, it makes me want to cry. Like I was so sideswiped by it. And then when I finally got my bearings straight, I was like, who is paying these people off? Like what is going on? I couldn't make any sense of it. Um, I think I understand it a little bit better now, but I think a lot of people joined the side of the majority out of fear and not wanting to be, you know, they just didn't have the, I just have a thick skin and I'm like, whatever, I'll die on this sword. I really, I'm not going to back down. They're going to have to kill me to silence me at this point. <laughs> Knock on wood. Like I, I just, no, I will not stand by while lies are being told. And I, um, and I wonder how many of these folks really embodied their medicine and maybe they learned it, maybe they studied it, maybe they practiced it. But, you know, I was a chronically sick individual. I was really, really sick. And my journey through medicine was to really heal myself and then to help heal my family mm-hmm. And so it's been a, you know, I've seen it work and it's not, I know I I love pharmaceuticals when needed. I'm bringing on, I just told you, like I had a really bad UTI. I Mm -hmm. needed antibiotics. It was terrible to take them, but like, thank God (laughs) they were there. And I certainly used some pharmaceuticals during COVID. I'm all for it, but also I went into it with a full trust of my immune function. I knew I was going to be fine. I remember someone, one of my friends yelling at me saying, you need to get the, the juice. You're, Mm -hmm. you're, what if you end up in the hospital? And I'm like, there's no way I'm going to end up in the hospital. Mm-hmm. I'm very sure of that. 
Like I very much trust my system because probably because I've ridden out a few bad viruses. Also, I knew I had the right tools. I understand that not every human had access to that, but I think every human didn't have access to that because it was all silenced and politicized. There could have been a lot of lives saved if we had. I really thought when this started, I was like, naturopathic doctors are going to save the world. Yeah, me like too. I was ready. I was excited. We were going to step up and do our medicine and we were going to help so many people. And my colleagues that did step up have had such incredible outcomes from their clinical setting and mm -hmm. just turned basically into like COVID clinics and just treating people with IVs and with, and it, not to a um, large cost. This mm -hmm. wasn't, this wasn't super expensive stuff. You know, these drugs are cheap yeah. and having really good outcomes. And I don't know where the divide happened, but I think I'm going to guess by the fact that I was voted onto the board by about 40% of the members of my state association that there's like sleeper cells. Mm. I think about 40 to 50% of my profession is on our team. Mm -hmm. They're just not public about it maybe, or they're afraid of the, the retaliation or whatever might happen. Well, there's yeah. real, I mean, my license was at risk. Yeah. I've gotten stories through the grapevine of what went down and like, I got reported a lot from what I understand by a particular group of people. And I, uh, hmm. I, you know, but I, Last I checked, the First Amendment still stands, and thank God my board stands by that as well. Awesome. Um, and I had data to support everything I was saying, so I, I think there was just a silencing. And not all practitioners had as good of luck, and I think that in different states, and depending on your degree, a lot of doctors were erroneously, um, they lost their license. They lost their ability to practice just for standing up. Right. Which is not good. Speaking of standing up, um, you, you, we talked about POTS. And I've experienced that too. And that's why I, I do want to talk about that. Because um, I think for some people, they think, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm scared of Omicron because I can get this long haul. And then you've, we've heard of POTS. But yeah, this is a this is a common thing. Like if, if you're super stressed out, or for me, it was when I was bike racing and I would stand up and I would get lightheaded. And it was like, I was just overdoing it, right? And, and so par do you think part of the pathophysiology, so to speak, of that with regards to COVID is, yes, maybe for some people it's stressful. They have all this smoldering inflammation. So the adrenals are in cortisol. There's anti-inflammatory effects of cortisol. It could be, like you said, adrenal fatigue. I mean, could that be part of it? Oh, for sure. You know, if you don't have, if your adrenals aren't working, you won't get that norepinephrine when you stand up and you don't get the, you don't get the blood return. So mm -hmm. I think that here's how I see it. Mm -hmm. I fully expected when this showed up that it might be a challenge for myself and for my family members. And I fully expected to have a recovery period. And I think a lot of people are being called long haulers. And this is no disrespect to the many millions of long haulers out there, because I know they come in all shapes and sizes. And, you know, some people are reporting they're fine after the infection. And then it's 90 days later, they suddenly get hit with some horrific mm. symptomology. So I understand and I have full respect because I've lived with a version of long haulers myself, again, to a different virus. But I fully expected the recovery to take some time. And a lot of these studies are looking at folks like 30, 60 days, 90 days later and saying, well, they have long haulers. And it's mm -hmm. like, maybe they're just recovering from a gnarly virus. Mm -hmm. So we have to take that into consideration too. I also just understand that like I'm a, I have a few things that are a little off since I had COVID and like my menstrual cycle still, but I'm also perimenopausal. So who knows? Um, but I'm okay with it. Like, it's kind of like having a baby. You don't expect to come out of it and be the same ever again. And so I didn't expect full recovery immediately. Mm -hmm. I will get there. I'm very used to rebuilding. Mm -hmm. And I really would always try to encourage my patients that had something traumatic happen, whether it's a death in the family or a severe illness or a bad flu. Sometimes you're just never, ever exactly the same. And it might take some time or pregnancy, a birth. Mm -hmm. It takes some time. And so there's a rebuild. I definitely had a hard time coming out of postpartum, for example. So I try to just tell people to be kind to themselves and know that there's a little bit of a rebuild. They might have to incorporate electrolytes more often. Um, I walk around with those Redmond real salt rocks, those salt rocks. Oh, yeah. I have those in everything. I like suck on my rock all the time. Uh, it's, I knew it was going to take me some time to get back to it in the gym. And so my coach knew, like, we're just going to slowly ease you back in. And my strength returned pretty quickly, but my ability to, like, regulate my balance didn't. Mm. So I didn't invert myself. I knew there was going to be some, we know it's an inflammatory condition. And really, at the end of the day, I think COVID is a vascular disease, mm -hmm. you know. And so there's going to be some vascular sequelae. And so I didn't do my inversion stuff as much. I just was really, and I tell everyone, all my friends who get it, I'm like, be really good to your vascular system for the next at least six months. You know, like keep your alcohol, cut your alcohol. 
um, take your fish oil, take your whatever you like to do. You know, I like curcumin or maybe enzymes, whatever. And just know that eat really well because you're recovering, you're training for life. And this virus is going to keep coming back. And this variant is so different that you and I having natural immunity the way we do may not actually protect us entirely from this. We may get it. Um, and that's okay. We're yeah, just going to keep life. We're just going to keep on. <laughs> we've been living with pathogens for, for as long as we've been on earth. I mean, this, this idea that it's just going to be eradicated and we're never going to have to deal with it. Yeah. It's, um, it's wild. So I got like the ancestral strain and then Omicron in May. Have you, which, when did you get infected? I got Delta, I think in November, okay. I got it early November of last year and it was pretty gnarly. And then Del or Omicron seemed to come around. I did catch a cold somewhere. You know, it's funny. I, I just, I ended up with a whole stockpile of those home tests. First, I went to a conference and they gave us a bunch of them. So I played with them and every single time I swabbed my nose, whether I had a cold or not, they always came back semi-positive. Mm. So I was just sort of messing with them to see. But I, I don't know, I'm not terrible. My immune system's intact. And so therefore, I think from the studies I've been looking at, mm -hmm. um, sh everything should be fine. I think that the, the folks who are like highly juiced might have some compromise in their immune system against what's coming down the chute. And I don't really know what that looks like, but um, it's, we're seeing it in real time. Now, if you look at the death rates in the UK and some of the highly vaccinated countries like Israel, look at Australia and New Zealand. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the other thing, right? We got called terrible names for saying zero COVID would never work. Mm -hmm. And I tried to, folks would come into my DMs and say the worst things to me. And I'm like, I'm not trying to, I mean, call me a murderer, all kinds of things. And I'm like, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just telling you, your country locked you down so hard that you have no natural immunity. So when it does get in and it will get in, you're going to see it burn through, mm -hmm. right? And here we are. So if you look at these countries and you can just see the upticks in deaths. And I think that what we're dealing with, with, with this particular variant is of concern. And I am concerned about this fall and winter. And I think that regardless of what, where you are in all of this, having your metabolic health intact would be likely the most logical step to start taking. Right. And, and the good news about that is, is this can happen in real time. Literally you take two diabetics, you give them the same meals. Someone goes for a walk. You see immediate postprandial post meal reductions in glucose and improvements. One good night's sleep versus one bad night's sleep is, you know, quantifiable in terms of the deleterious effects of poor night's sleep. So this right. is, you know, <laughs> people say we don't have time. Yeah. You have to eat today. You have to walk today. You have to go to sleep. So like you do have time, you can start today. Um, so, for me, I mean, I think the most effective things are sleep and exercise and then nutrition. And I want to get to your strategies and, and tactics with regards to like how much you weight lift and what your feeding window looks like and all that, because, you know, obviously metabolic health is important to you for all sorts of conditions and things. But so what do you do on a meal window standpoint? What is your, what is your, well, for, actually let's talk about alcohol first, because I, I don't okay. know that Alfie, are you still yeah, I quit alcohol in January. I had a little bit when I went on vacation and it was terrible. I felt terrible. Mm -hmm. I felt terrible during, I immediately got riddled with anxiety. Like the minute the alcohol hit my system, I was just super anxious and paranoid. And I was like, well, this is a terrible feeling. Yeah. <laughs> and then I tried it one more time. I tried to have a glass of wine at dinner and immediately felt just paranoid anxious, and anxious. Eh? Yeah, it was terrible. So no alcohol. It's Good not my you. friend. I think I'm just at that age. You know, I'm in my late forties and I think it was actually driving my estrogen and it was really causing sort of like a dumpiness, like a puffy, you know, that puffy doughy est high estrogen, bad PMS. Like I was having a lot of symptoms and I was constantly texting Carrie, Dr. Carrie Jones, our mutual friend. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Carrie, what about this? And she's like, Tina, it's the wine. And it wasn't very much wine. Like I don't, my friends who know me laugh because I'm such a lightweight. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't really hold my alcohol. I just immediately start throwing up if I have too much in me. So that was the big joke. Like, oh, you know, and my my um, response to going alcohol free was such a big deal that people on Instagram are like, you must have been drinking heavily. And I'm like, no, I literally can't. <laughs> That's the mm -hmm. funny part. It's just that slow drip. I think I have, you know, I have that like double MTHFR mutation. I don't think I detox well. I think I've had a lot of mit mitochondrial compromise in my life through antibiotic use and just, uh, you know, just my interesting life. And I think alcohol was just straight up poison in my system. So that's been really helpful. 
That's awesome. You know, I think a lot of people do struggle with alcohol, but there's such a habit formed around it. Having wine with dinner, going to happy hour, going to, you know, and I get it. Like I drink periodically, but um, I I definitely feel way better when I don't. Um, So going cold turkey like that and just cutting it off. I think that's, that's brilliant. I think that's awesome. Thanks. I mean, I quit smoking. I smoked for 10 years as a young person from 14 to 24. And I just quit that. I just quit. I've quit a lot of things. Uh, And I thought, I don't know. I mean, Again, like pain and vanity are important <laughs> motivators. And so I don't want to age poorly. I want to have, I want to have vitality and beauty as long as I can. Um, I was not getting good gains in the gym. Everything was one step forward, two steps back. I was starting to hit that point where I was starting to break down. I didn't know what it was. It really caused a lot of orthopedic like crunchiness. You feel just crunchy when you wake up and gluey and like everything was gluing together and feeling yucky. And I was post COVID to be honest. So I had it in November. I had some cognition issues and I've already got perimenopausal cognition issues. So I was like, something has to give and I have to cut. What can I cut out? There really isn't much left because I'm I'm pretty clean or all around. And so I, I was like, booze, that's got to be poisoning my brain. Mm-hmm. So cut booze. And interestingly, I was using alcohol to offset this low grade anxiety, which I didn't even realize was there. I just had lived with it my whole life hmm. and it was being driven by the alcohol. So I was using alcohol the next day to deal with the anxiety, the glass of wine the night before was giving me. And then, you know, I wear this stupid aura ring mm-hmm. and which I don't really love and it's not very attractive, but it definitely gives me feedback on my sleep and my sleep is delicious now. Mm. (laughs) It's so good. And my deep sleep was being destroyed by alcohol. And so that's enough for me. Like you need that deep sleep for so many good reasons and having my sleep on point is. That's key. Yeah. That's so good. That's amazing. I, I have a friend who quit drinking wine as well. And his sleep numbers just kept getting better and better the longer that he was off alcohol. And it almost took me a little while to believe it. And now it's been several years for him. This was in like 2019. He hasn't had a drink since because he's like, for him, managing a company and all these different things that he's doing, he's like, dude, I need my sleep, you know? And yeah, so that's pretty empowering. My heart rate variability has doubled. Wow. I couldn't get it out of the 20s. I was like, I'm dying. According to this data, I'm dying. I'm doing everything right. And that was a big one. That's it. You know, you can't be like, I have so, I have so many different sources of income and so many different businesses that I'm running. And you know, my job is to be a content creator really at the end of the day, as is yours. Right. And I was losing motivation. I was losing tolerance. I was just losing my drive and my cognition. And I, their creativity was gone and I was just, you know, the world was kind of going to hell in a handbasket and Mm -hmm. I was really frustrated. And I, I was like, I can't, I can't do my job and I can't, I don't know anyone who's a high performer who makes great money and does great things in the world who drinks regularly. That was kind of it for me. Like all the people I surround myself didn't drink. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I, I'm trying to emulate these great people who are doing really that's the thing you know people can call us all the names they want but i want to ask them what are you doing to be helpful Mm, because we're putting ourselves out there constantly trying to help people whether they like what we're saying or not Mm -hmm. and we're constantly trying to come up with new and innovative ways to get through to people and be convincing so that they hear it in a way that maybe resonates with them and that takes a lot of work Mm -hmm. and we're trying to help people at the end of the day and i just wasn't able to be as helpful when i was feeling crunchy and hungover. that is such a great way to think about it that's so Dropping the booze, amazing. And then um, the gym, well, I, I was going to get to your feeding windows. Um, are you into fasting? What are you? I have such a long history with eating disorders that I try really hard not to make my food thing weird. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, like I try not to get too hyper, uh, you know, obsessed with it. So I eat when I'm hungry, but I try to keep it about 13 hours because that's what the data says for, you know, keeping cancer at bay. So I try to not eat for about 13 hours. But if I go too long, I will wake up in the middle of the night starving. Mm -hmm. So I try to have a little bit of, I try to go to bed early. That's another thing. Getting to bed on time helps people offset not, I mean, there's a lot of eating that happens after 9 p.m., Mm -hmm. right? It's not good eating. (laughs) Yeah, it's not good eating. So I try to have like my last bit of snack around 8.30 at -hmm. night, maybe a little protein or a little fat or whatever, a little carbohydrate. And that definitely helps ensure some better sleep. And then I... Don't eat until maybe 10 or 11 the mm. next day. And that's kind of how I always ate. That's like good. as a kid, even I wouldn't eat breakfast. Yep. I wouldn't eat my, I would eat when we had our first break at school. Mm-hmm. And so I just kind of eat the way I've always eaten. And it turns out 
you know, they wanted to call me anorexic, but I think I was actually just appropriately fasting, yeah. <laughs> intermittent fasting. So, and then I might take a whole day sometimes where I don't eat much at all. Mm-hmm. I try to kind of go on, it's not a religious thing, but I usually pick Sunday mm. to just kind of rest my gut, yeah. which is an old naturopathic thing. Right. That's been, yeah, people have been doing that. And there's a lot of benefits there too. I mean, um, and that helps you sort of refill what um, actual hunger is because later that Sunday night or Monday morning, like you're ready, like your your (laughs) hunger cues are kicking in. And I think so many of us have just, those are muted because we've been eating out of habit or because we should eat. We're told we need to have breakfast, even though we're not hungry. So yeah, that's a great, great tip. If I go too long without food, my cortisol starts driving and then I aberrantly wake up and then I just have anxiety and it's not fun. So I just really, I'm big on people eating clean enough and eating good enough and taking good care enough of themselves that their instincts turn on and then you eat according to your instincts. That's how I would counsel patients. Right, I like that. Uh, And then training. So I know you're big into kettlebells. And then when we did the podcast, it was, um, was that in 20, that was 2016. That's crazy. Six years ago. (laughs) Um, So the glutes for you were a big one. You have a hip thrust, uh, you're in a squatting, deadlifting. What does your training look like now? So kettlebells, I really love the kettlebell swing. I can't do the barbell deadlift anymore because my hips are just not, I had some kind of weird hormonal thyroid thing happen and my, both my hips kind of went out on me. But once Mm -hmm. I got that under control, things improved. So I don't think it was so much a I mean, yeah, maybe it was because I was doing a lot of sumo deadlifts at heavy weights, but also there was some kind of metabolic hormonal thing happening and it all happened very quickly and it was very disturbing. But once I got that under control, uh, barbell deadlifts are out. My cartilage doesn't like it. That's okay. I was very upset about it for a while. Now I use the hack bar Oh yeah. or the trap bar. I can get good weight on that. That's kind of a squatty deadlift. And then I love the kettlebell swings. I love them because they're a ballistic deadlift, right? So they're great for building the booty. I still am totally convinced that you, you know, you brought this idea up to me really that blood sugar dysregulation starts in the quads and in the big leg muscles. And I've ran with that in my research and it's like, that's the beginning of the end wasting. And I found that in my patients, they would come in with so much pain and so many different issues. And if they had no butt, like the minute someone's butt goes flat, that's the big, uh uh-oh. And I came out of COVID with like the flattest rear end and my husband had the, <laughs> that's, I can always tell when someone's had COVID, I'm like, oh, their butt's gone. They had mm-hmm. COVID. So having some junk in your trunk, whether it's muscle and or fat, I think is insurance. Mm-hmm. And so really, you know, and I, with that comes a little belly for me and oh, well, mm-hmm. but as long as, and I've been in places with my hormones where like my breasts were just def- deflated and my booty was deflated because my hormones were so out of whack. And so for me, vitality really is like, staying juicy in mm-hmm. your in your you know figure but also in your musculature and in your joints being lubricated and just everything feeling kind of juicy instead of dried out and flat and so that is why I train so I train pretty decently with my coach 2 days a week and then I have a third day where I really just hammer my my booty mm-hmm. and cool. my lower legs and do a lot. I do have to do a lot more mobility now than I used to (laughs) as I age, which is fine. And I try to go for like two walks a day. I try to follow my own advice and go for two walks a day, especially after meals. And I am happy and I sleep good. And I really judge my sleep and my libido. Mm -hmm. Those are the two things that start to go when things are out of whack. And so if I overtrain or I'm under training, Mm -hmm. I'll notice pretty quick. Yeah. And that's good for people to tune into that. Right. Um, yeah, I, I read a lot of comments about peri and, from peri and postmenopausal women about the hormonal shifts and the associated body compositional shifts as a result of going through menopause. Um, but what I hear, you know, from you is like, hey, look, I'm getting out in front of this. I'm doing all these things to mitigate some of that. And so, are you on any hormones, whether it's progesterone, testosterone? I use a little progesterone. I was using a lot of hormones, and what I found is is they can get away from you as well. And now you're driving the wrong pathways. Mm -hmm. And so I was sort of in this, I was doing a little testosterone and that was miraculous at first. I actually started it to heal my hips up because I just really needed some anabolic support and getting my hips online. But then it started to aromatase into estrogen and I started getting thicker here and I was starting to thicken up just everywhere. And I was like, this is not good. Mm -hmm. And, you know, couple that with like a glass of wine every night, it was just a mess. So a little bit of progesterone, but I forget to take it. <laughs> most you do of oral the time. or is it um, a, a cream? I use a cream. Okay. 
I know that some folks need hormones and I definitely think over 40, some hormones are helpful and I'll probably need them again at some point. But as long as my libido and my sleep are intact and I'm having good gains in the gym and I'm getting stronger every day and my appetite is good, I'm okay with it. You know, I try to use them as sparingly as possible. I'm not a big fan of taking a lot of them. That's good. And I definitely have like the middle age middle is real, but Mm -hmm. I've always had a belly. Like that's always been the way I've been built. So that's just kind of my thing. And I'm okay with it. As long as, again, my immune system is intact. Mm -hmm. It's really important. The only time I've ever had flat abs, like perfectly washboard stomach was when I had pneumonia Mm -hmm. or when I was chronically stressed out and just like in a kachexic you know, cortisol state. And so I'm like, Hey, if I got a little belly and I got a booty and I can fly through, you know, a, a a virus, Mm -hmm. I'm calling it good. You're good. That's awesome. (laughs) That's where where I'm at. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's great. And so basically what I heard there is you have to have the foundations in place, you know, for the hormones to then be in line. So what would you say to someone who has experienced a lot of body composition changes as they've, you know, transitioned into menopause and things. Would you obviously reinforce these boring fundamentals? Is yes. that, is that kind of what we're, where we're going? My first question always is, are you strength training? And for how long have you been? Because it doesn't just happen overnight. Right. And then number two is, are you drinking any alcohol whatsoever? And then number three is like, are you being a little carb piggy? Truly take a good hard look at your carbohydrate intake because I'm not for no carbs. I do like some carbs, but I think you have to earn your carbs and that's best done on days that you lift. So I, you know, I, I like my carbs. I like my snacky food sometimes, but I can't bring them in the house because I don't have a lot of control once they're there. (laughs) I have a story for you on that. Yeah. So I just try to mitigate that by... Um, and my body composition tells me everything. Right. And then if my stress gets out of control, I definitely start gaining weight in the midsection. Mm -hmm. If my sleep has been, if I'm a little bit of a vampire syndrome and my husband goes to bed hard at 9 PM, 9 30. And if I decide to stay up, I get that weird boost where then I'm up to like 11 or midnight Mm -hmm. and I start to notice the belly fat coming on. It's a little fluff first. Mm -hmm. Right. And then it, so for me, everything is about keeping that waist. And we have this data again, I've, been called all kinds of names for promoting this but my big thing online is like keep your waist circumference in check because we have so much data from all over the world showing and different you know cultures above 35 inches for women and above 40 inches for women is a red flag and really really high risk for developing diabetes type 2 diabetes so like keeping that waist circumference down is I get on the scale like two three times a week just to see where I'm at and then waist circumference. And it kind of goes back to labs. I don't use labs as like, I need to get into these perfect parameters. I use all data as just a gauge of where I'm at. Mm -hmm. And I use it to track long term, like, am I improving? Or am I, you know, is it going downhill? Mm -hmm. And so I think just keeping a really good parameter for me is just getting on the scale a couple times a week, not overdoing it, I try not to obsess and then waist circumference. It's beautiful. And and I love that comment about, I can't have the sweets in the house because you'll just crush it. <laughs> yeah, I, I came back from a conference last week in Austin, KetoCon, and some of these companies are making these amazing like zero carb, low carb cookies using allulose and monk fruit. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll get some for Inez. And we crushed it in like two days. And th- there was like 30 cookies in there. I'm like, what are we doing? <laughs> so yeah, just that stuff is tempting as it is that the, the, the ability to control it is really hard. So for folks, um, you have to get the whole family on board with this, you know, I mean, if, if it's just you and the kids or the, your spouse is into the treats and the snacks and the cookies, it, you're going to eat them. Yeah. They can't be in the house. Can't. It's not, it's not, it doesn't work. I can't bring ice cream in. I can't bring chips are the worst, anything crunchy and salty. It's mm-hmm. all over for me. So usually my gut, rejects me and I get, you know, terrible gut issues the next day. So it's pretty easy to not go back to them, but man, if they're there and I'm hungry, Mm -hmm. so I have to eat the, you know, and there's all this data, like eat your foods in this order and blah, blah, blah. It's like, we've known this forever. If you're going to eat some carbohydrate, get some fat in there with it, right? If you're going to eat some corn chips, eat some guacamole. I realize that we can like dig out the details, but really at the end of the day, just keep that glucose response lower, Mm -hmm. right? If you're going to eat, like for me, I, my husband cracks up because I am a stickler for really good, high quality ice cream, like mm. real cream and sugar. Because if you look at the, the, you know, glucose response to that, it's not very big. Mm. 
a, I had a patient who was a type one diabetic share this with me. He's like, if I eat a bowl of white rice, my glucose goes crazy. If I eat, you know, it was the Kirkland brand. It was the Costco mm. vanilla organic ice cream. That was just cream and sugar. That's basically, it was like one or two or three, you know, two or three ingredients. And his response was so mellow because of the fat that was in there. So, you know, eat your protein first and your fat first, and then have some carbohydrates. It's not, We've known this forever, right? right? Like just eat intelligently. I like that. Uh, speaking of eating intelligently and protein, I know you eat a lot of red meat. Yeah. Um, did you, were you ever a vegan at any point? Yeah. No, I was a vegetarian though okay. for 10 years and destroyed my health and uh, led to crippling, crippling depression and anxiety to mm -hmm. the point where I was heavily medicated by psychiatrists. And really it was just massive protein deficiency looking back. I just hosted my mastermind event out at the farm and I had, you know, 11 of my mastermind doctors out there and they're all pretty much on the tip, but they're still, you know, some of them are still eating a lot of fish and chicken and such. And because they were grouped up in Airbnbs, they all ate beef for five days. Mm. And two of them at the end of it were like, I just ate nothing but beef for five days. And I said, how do you feel? And they both said, I feel great. So like beef is brilliant. It's they can turn garbage into highly nutritious, highly absorbable nutrients. <laughs> it's right. amazing. I mean, I had these white spots on my fingernails my whole life and I would take copious amounts of zinc and copious amounts of iron, of course, separate. So they didn't compete with each other for like 10 years. And I was chronically low ferritin and iron deficient. And I was chronically zinc deficient due to the white spots. And I have no white spots anymore. And my ferritin is beautiful. And I just, and I don't even eat that much. Like I don't eat the amount of grams I should. I have a hard time. I just have a funny gut and it doesn't always give, let me put into it as much as I think I need. So I eat as much red meat as I can inject, get in comfortably. And I feel great. And are you eating red meat daily? Would you say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pretty much. That's all I, I won't eat chickens anymore. They're gross. They're, yeah. they're, um, I'll eat eggs. Mm. Chickens are little dinosaurs. <laughs> well, and the chicken that you get at the grocery store is, uh, it, talk about the most processed and and the most inhumane form of agriculture there is yeah. uh cattle are big they're harder con to control same with pigs but chickens you can put them in little cages and they literally don't move or um these concrete you know uh factories essentially yeah so definitely or chickens it's it's sad i try to eat ruminants mm -hmm. because they do again my gut is not superb it's been the reason I was on antibiotics is because I got put on them at birth. So I had no microbiome. So I tend to need, I hate it, but I tend to need antibiotics more than I wish. And because of that, I have a funny microbiome. And so absorbing things has not been my high point. And ruminant animals do me good. And yeah. monogastric animals are not my jam that much. And they make yucky fats. They eat yucky fats. They make yucky fats. So I don't want to, I don't need their nasty omega sixes. Right. <laughs> So it's tough. Yeah. I just try to, I just try to keep myself with the ruminants. I find that ground beef really does nice for me. It's easy to digest. I really like my instant pot because it sort of breaks down the meat for me. So anyone having gastrointestinal issues, you know, find stuck uh, cuts of steak. I think skirt steak is a nice one. Anything that tenderloin is great. Filet mignon, anything that breaks up easily, but using, oh, crock pot, um, roast, you know, anything that sort of does the digesting for me, I have found to be just so much easier and helpful. And if I have a big roast, I can eat off of it all week. Mm -hmm. And my husband makes me lots of ground beef patties and just cooks them all up for me and have, has them in the fridge. And I feel so much better. That's awesome. And my strength gains are awesome. Right. And I don't need any hormones anymore. So I think I was sort of chronically malnourished and was using all this other stuff to, mm -hmm. I hardly take any supplements anymore. I used to take you know, gads of it. And so I think it's, I'm on the right path. That's awesome. Good for you. Yeah. And I love that using the crock pot or cooking a big roast. I mean, you, you invest a small amount of time up front and then you get all this back end food. So yeah, we always have the uh, slow cooker or the uh, pressure cooker going. So yeah. Phenomenal. Well, Tina, this has been great. Kind of a version two to talk, uh, to, to circle back a little bit on the importance of muscle now, um, for all sorts of different applications, you know, um, you know, mitigating postmenopausal issues, but from enhancing the immune system, what else are you excited about? And then what, what other content do you have in your podcast that people should look for? 
Well, I'm trying to help people just become more resilient through this. So like I said, I am a bit concerned about this variant and what's happening this winter for lots of reasons I don't have to get into, but I am talking about that on my podcast. I have a private membership portal called Resiliency University that I'm I'm doing a don't be zombie bait summer camp <laughs> right yeah. now. So I'm trying to get people through because I figure if we can, I, I'm just taking people through what I do every summer. So every, because I have tended towards viral infections and pneumonia. Mm-hmm. And so I really start getting ready about July and getting myself ready for that. So we're doing that in there. And then just Instagram, just right. doubling down on the info, trying to stay out of track. I got out of shadow ban there. So I, I, it's like a whole new world. Your I, handcuffs are off. That's good. I just don't say anything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I actually took a whole week off from doing anything and I actually got more followers than I have. And so it's, that's awesome. testament to the shadow banning that they are doing to both of us. It is weird. Yeah. I mean, if you talk about <laughs> anything outside of, you know, cat videos and Joe Biden's favorite ice cream flavor, you're like throttled back. It's the weirdest thing. I have found that you're allowed to uh, actually shame people. You just can't talk about the virus. It's mm. pretty weird because I see some accounts saying some pretty horrific things about other humans and yet they're fine right. and they're growing. But if you say anything about the virus, you're so we just can't talk about that there. That's I talk so about that on my sub stack. Everybody can find all of it at my website site. It's just drtina.com and everything is, you can navigate there. But I think that uh, getting your metabolic health is paramount. And I'm trying to help people do that right now because it's summer. Let's take advantage of it. Totally. No, I think that's awesome. I guess final question. Um, so I would refer people to you if they had orthopedic issues for PRP and Prolo and stuff, but you're not doing that anymore. So where are you sending people that need? I don't know. <laughs> it's tough. I don't have a good answer because I practiced a very particular way. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a lot of good docs out there. I would call around. They all have a different style and they all have different backgrounds. And so just kind of finding an, a practitioner in your area. I do think it's important to find someone who understands prolotherapy, though, because a lot of doctors are just jumping straight to the stem cells, which I think is nice if you're in terrible, terrible condition. But I don't think everybody needs that. I think a lot of people, especially the healthy folks like us who are fit, um, prolotherapy, PRP, plenty strong. And so having a skilled practitioner that actually knows prolotherapy is kind of the base. So find someone that can do that. And they're, they're all over, right? You just got to dig a little harder, but be leery of the places that are just stem cell only. Mm -hmm. I think those are a little bit of a factory and not everyone, but there's some good docs out there doing that work too. I can see that because that's the buzzword that people are looking for stem cells. But really, like you said, it's a lot of it is the prolo. That's yeah, that's the mechanism. That's the good starting point good, because yeah. it will kick the body into gear to start doing the thing. And then you can add the fancy stuff in the syringe later. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for coming on. This yeah. Was great. Thanks for having me.